the word circadian literally means uh, near 24 hours. So a body actually has this circadian wisdom or a body has this 24 hours rhythms and I will talk about those rhythms. Uh, what I'll do is I'll give you 10 takeaway wisdoms and the first one is circadian rhythms are the ultimate sign of health. So for example, those of you who were lucky enough to go to bed around 10 o'clock last night, then your deep sleep happened around 2 or 3 and anticipating waking up, your body actually warms up 1 or 2 hours before waking up and your blood pressure also begins to rise, your heart beats slightly faster after waking up. Uh, when we see the bright light, then uh, melatonin, the sleep hormone goes down, the stress hormone cortisol rises, bowel movement is most likely in the morning and then insulin sensitivity is actually best right now. So if you have craving for sweets, this is the best time. <laughs> and Glenda, thank you for putting me to speak at this time because this is the time when we have highest alertness. <laughs> uh, so hopefully you can take away some of the... <laughs> And then afternoon is the best time for um, exercise, so muscle performance and risk for injury is actually less uh, in the uh, late afternoon than in the evening. If you're in a darker room, then anticipating wake, uh, sleeping, your melatonin level will rise, your body temperature will begin to fall down and you'll go back to sleep. So in fact, if you think about an ideal day, this is exactly how our body should function. So that's why I say, uh, circadian rhythms are actually the ultimate biomarkers of vitality, health and vigor. And how are these rhythms regulated or how are these uh, rhythms generated? It's pretty complex but I'll boil it down to three important things. So the circadian rhythms regulate at least three foundations of health. So that's sleep, nutrition and physical activity and they interact reciprocally. So for example, if you lose sleep for one night, it also disrupts your rhythms. It affects your food choices and physical activity next day, etc. And each of these sleep, physical activity and nutrition metabolism is also under what we call homeostasis. So for example, if you don't eat for a day, the next day you are more likely to uh, overeat. And all of these are under the control of light and darkness. And again, our body actually warms up and cools down every single day. So there is another internal rhythm in temperature. So all these four or five rhythms work together to give us daily rhythms in physiology, metabolism, etc. And uh, how are these rhythms actually organized in the body? So the second wisdom is these are controlled by what we call circadian clocks that are present in almost every organ. So just like our brain has a clock that makes us to sleep every night so that brain can reset, repair and rejuvenate, almost every organ in our body, even our hair follicle, even our skin has its own clock. And these clocks work together along with the brain clock to drive these daily rhythms in physiology, metabolism, behavior, and even our gut microbiome also cycles. So we go to bed with one set of gut microbes and we wake up with another set in our uh, gut microbes. Um, and actually, uh, literally every hormone, every brain chemical enzyme, and even every gene rises and falls at certain time of the day. And this is a bold claim. And we cannot do these kind of experiments in humans. So it took us almost 10 years to do this study in baboons in Africa. We actually collected 64 different uh, tissue samples, including 22 different brain regions from baboons uh, collected in every two hours. And when we look at uh, which genes turn on and off in different parts of the body or brain, uh, what you're looking at is uh, almost like a clockwork in 64 different tissues. Whenever you see that peak, that's when that many number, hundreds of genes turn on, uh, for example, in kidney and um, brain, in different parts of the brain, even gut, etc. So the bottom line is, uh, at least in baboons, who are almost very close to our ancestors, uh, nearly 11,000 genes turn on in the middle of the day. And then, just like our body goes to sleep, almost our genome or our genes go back to sleep because what you see here is in the middle of the night, there are only 700 genes that actually peaks. So that means our genome literally goes to sleep. And why this is important is, in modern days, as many of us stay awake late into the night, then perhaps we are disturbing that circadian coordination of gene activity throughout day and light. And um, 
so how are these uh, how are these rhythms uh, connected to the outside world i kind of alluded to you about staying awake late into the night the reason why we stay awake is we have access to light so every time we flip the light switch whether it's on or off or when we step outside to get some bright light we are literally changing hormones and brain chemicals and because the reason is all the circadian system is connected to the outside world primarily not exclusively through light that's perceived through our eye. And what is interesting is this is not the regular way we see or perceive the outside world. There are specialized cells. So almost 16, 17 years ago, uh, my lab along with two other labs, we co-discovered a new light receptor called melanopsin. You don't have to remember the name. It's a blue light sensing protein that's present in only 5,000 cells in each human retina. And it's very small number of cells because we use 12 to 17 million cells to see our visual world, but these are only present in 5,000 cells, and those are the cells that look like that, those red cells, and they actually made it to New York Times a few years ago. And uh, why these are important is these melanopsin cells are very less sensitive to light, and particularly less sensitive to candlelight or orange color light. So that means when our ancestors had only access to firelight or candlelight in the evening, uh, these cells were not activated. So that's how the brain was thinking it's already dark and it allowed the sleep hormone melatonin to rise at night and we had better night sleep. And during daytime, this melanopsin, this blue light sensing protein, actually needs a lot of light to be fully activated. This amount of light right here is not enough to fully activate it. So as our ancestors walked outside, then the bright daylight actually activated melanopsin, synchronized their clock, it, uh, raised alertness and dep uh, reduced depression. But things have changed, so now we spend most of our time indoor. At night time, we have bright screens and bright light at night. In fact, we get now at least 100 times more light at night time than what we are programmed to see. It disrupts our circadian rhythm, reduces sleep hormone melatonin, and we have poor sleep. And then during daytime, just like we are doing right now, we are getting 1,000 times less light than what we are programmed to see. So for example, even if in a, in a cloudy day in Aspen in winter, if you walk outside, you'll get 10,000 locks of light. And right now, with these two lights falling on my eye, I'm getting only 100 locks of light. And you guys are getting 50 locks of light. So when these things continue, when you have more light at night and less light during the day, then we have sleepless night and foggy brain. And if it continues for weeks, months, or years, then that increases the risk I'm not saying that it causes, increases the risk for many of these diseases that are listed here. So that's why for the first time in human history, we have complete control over spectral quality, quantity, and timing of light, and how can we use that to start a new revolution to promote health. A few years ago, I worked with Rosie Blau of The Economist, and she came up with this cover page article in The Intelligent Life, and she captured all of this in, in that in that wording, the light therapeutics. Can we use light as a therapeutic agent? But at the same time, uh, we don't know much about light because it's very difficult to do these studies on light. So what we don't know, uh, at least the scientists are agreeing on, is to treat depression, at least one should have 10,000 logs of light for 15 to 60 minutes. So if you walk outside, not under, a sun, not under bright sunlight, even on the daylight in a cloudy day, that's 10,000 lux of light. And having that light for 15, to, uh, 15 minutes to one hour is enough. An average person should get at least 1,000 lux of light for 30 minutes during the first half of the day to synchronize the brain with the outside world, and less than 20 lux of light for two to three hours before going to bedtime. And my group is involved in quite a few of these activities in policy making and other stuff. For example, we are working with an IEHS for, to develop the exposure guideline. And we work with ASRA and Delos to develop building codes and architectural design. And for real life light exposure, if you're curious, then you can also download this app from our lab, My Lux Recorder, that will tell you how much light is around. So that's how I know how much light is around here. And the app is pretty simple. Uh, it just, uh, for example, wherever I go, any airport I go, I just mark how much light I get. Frankfurt Airport on that day, there was 19 lux of light. And this is my uh, daughter's high school in the evening. She had 300 lux of light. And in fact, uh, the reason is this. 
These days when you go to a drugstore in the evening, CVS Pharmacy or Walgreens, there is 1,000 to 1,400 lux of light. And if you're taking your baby or little kid to drugstore at uh, nine o'clock in the night and standing in line for 15 to 20 minutes, that slams melatonin level down. So you won't be surprised why the kids don't sleep when they come back from stores. Um, okay, so now let's uh, change gear and talk about meals. So we know that whenever we serve a healthy meal in a dirty plate, that's unhealthy. And the new idea is timing makes healthy food junk. Eating the same healthy food at the wrong time can make it junk. Why is that? Because what happens is all the circadian rhythms should be tied to the outside world through light. When we eat at the wrong time, then the food takes over the entire system. So the food dictates uh, the clock in all of our, all of our uh, organs. And just imagine, uh, for example, our gut clock tells us that our gut cells should be repaired every night. In fact, we replace uh, seven to 10% of our gut lining every night. And just like we cannot repair a highway when the traffic is still flowing, you cannot repair that gut when you have that late night snack. And that's one example why timing makes a healthy food junk. And if it continues for several days, then we may get leaky gut and maybe Next speakers will talk about that. Um, so then the next wisdom is we always think that eating at the wrong time or getting exposed to light is only for shift workers like firefighters, nurses, doctors, astronauts, etc. But in fact, the new research is showing that almost 80% of us experience similar jet lag because in the weekend, when we stay awake for two to three hours late and have that late night meal, then it takes two to three days for our system to get back. So in every week, we are going back and forth. And uh, to summarize that, for example, our ancestors had a very strong circadian rhythm. During daytime, they had access to light. Nighttime was dark, and they had uh, opportunity to sleep for at least uh, eight, seven to eight hours. And during daytime, there was a lot of physical activity, and the opportunity to eat was limited because we could not store food overnight. And also food was uh, not plenty, so people ate two to three meals maximum. But the modern rhythms are very different. Whatever I said so far can be summarized in this, that we are always living in dimly lit room 24-7. Uh, Our opportunity to sleep has reduced. Our physical activity has reduced. And we are told that in every two to three hours we have to eat. So as a result, our rhythms are very disrupted. And and this is not fiction because what we do is we actually go and measure, monitor rhythms in ancestral population. For example, this is uh, data from Argentina and Toba who have no access to electrical lighting. What you are seeing is uh, this person was wearing the same watch that I am wearing that's collecting light information, red, green, and blue spectrum lighting, total lighting and activity. This is the first time in the morning this person wakes up and sees the first five locks of light. That's the last five locks of light. This is the 50 lux, this is 500 lux bright light. And that's the time he went to bed. Every day, this is 45 days of data. What you're looking at is standard deviation. So very small change in sleep time, bedtime around nine to 10 o'clock at night, wakes up exactly at dawn. And now we also monitor Seattle high school student. This is one high school student and you can see this person goes to bed almost around midnight. And this is another student who goes to bed around one o'clock. And uh, this actually continues because we are monitoring also UCSD college students and this person goes to bed around three and wakes up just before the class begins. Uh, so then the question is, why is that? Maybe there is a lot of stress and a lot of things. And one reason is actually teenagers are more sensitive to light than we are. So as a result, the same amount of light in your house that, will like, that is making you sleepy and you can go to bed around 10 o'clock will actually make that teenager stay awake till midnight. So we cannot change lighting in every teenager's house. What we can do is, since these teenagers are getting only six to less than six hours of sleep in Seattle, a um, bunch of us, we convinced the Seattle school board to change the high school start time. So as a result, they changed this high school start time, delayed start time by one hour. And what happened? So now these students are sleeping 34 minutes more. And why this is important is in last 70 years, US high school students have been losing sleep around 20 to 30 seconds every year. So by just delaying Seattle school start time by one hour, we have, we have moved the clock back to 1960. 
And you might think that since these kids are sleeping more, they may be doing bad in grades, but actually they improved their grades by 4.8%. And just imagine 54,000 students are now sleeping every single day, 30 minutes extra. This is almost like putting a drug in their system every single day. And imagine if we can do that for the entire nation, then we can actually improve student performance. So when we leave with this circadian rhythm disruption, maybe four or five days is not a disease, it's just a discomfort, but if we continue to live with circadian disruption for weeks, months, and years, then um, by reviewing uh, literature for over the last 25 years, what we are seeing is there are nearly 120 diseases for which the risk for the disease goes up if we live in the circadian disruptive ma manner. And some of these diseases actually affect the ones that are in red affect more than 10% of the adult population in this country. The one in yellow affect around 5% of the population. So in that way, there is a huge um, number of people who can benefit if we fix the clock, what we call the training, the circadian clock. So finally, a time-restricted eating, which is also popularly known as intermittent fasting. We started this almost seven years ago with a very simple experiment. We wanted to fix the circadian clock in mice. So what we did was we did a very simple experiment, two groups of mice, genetically identical, born to the same parents in the same room with the same microbiome, same genes, ate the same calories from the same food. The only difference was the first group of mice got to eat whenever they wanted, just like us, and then the second group was trained to eat all their food within eight to 10 hours or 12 hours max, and we did this experiment for 18 weeks first, and then now we have repeated it many times. The bottom line is, although they ate the same food, same number of calories, the first group was obese, diabetic, and had many of the metabolic disease uh, markers, and then the second group was completely protected from that. And then we repeated the experiment. Now we take the sick mice, and then we put them back into eight to 10 hours eating, and we can reverse it. And this is, Malika, for you, when you are saying that you cannot do intermittent fasting because it's eight hours. The reason why the experiment, initial experiment was done eight hours was the grad student who did the experiment had a girlfriend who did not let him to be in lab for more than nine hours. So that's why it was done eight hours. But then, you know, popular press takes off and then <laughs> intermittent fasting becomes eight hours. The bottom line is anyone from five-year-old to 100-year-old can and should eat within 12 hours and occasionally one can go down to eight hours or nine hours to get better benefit. And so over three years ago, we published a review in science. By that time, there was evidence for many of these diseases that can be improved by time-restricted eating. And then the question is, how do we go from mouse to human? The first thing is to see, when do people actually eat? And last 150 years of nutrition research have not collected objective data when people eat. So we came up with a simple app um, and uh, what, is, what is now called My Circadian Clock. Anyone, anywhere in the world can go to the website, do informed consent because it's a research study. What we ask people is to do a very simple thing in the first study. Open your app, one click, take a picture of your food, second click, and press set, third click. The food picture actually came to our server. And then we line them up on timeline to see when people actually ate something that had calories, at least five kilocal. And we monitor them for three weeks, and you are looking three weeks of data. Those are the weekends in red. And it looks very random. And if we combine this, it looks like as if this person was in uh, San Diego in the weekdays and was flying to New York in weekend. And this is exactly what we do, most of us do. <laughs> and if you combine this and put it around the clock, then this 21 days of data looks like this, and you might think, that he's an outlier. The top is 6 a.m., the bottom is 6 p.m. But in fact, we had 156 people who were not shift workers, not college students, and this is what was their eating pattern. As expected, they had uh, lunch and dinner at expected time. The amount of calories in each meal was also peaking around lunch and dinner, but what was surprising was the midnight snacks are not simple little bites. People actually wake up to have a bowl of cereal or have a tub of ice cream. So the bottom line is nearly 50% of adults eat for 15 hours or longer. So that means if your first cup of coffee with cream happened at 6 a.m., uh, your last um, uh, glass of wine maybe at 9 p.m. Okay, so what is an ideal circadian day to prevent, manage, or reverse chronic disease? So now we have quite a few clinical studies going on, and what we do is we ask people, forget about the absolute number in the outer circle, try to be in bed for eight hours so that you can get at least six to seven hours of sleep. 
And then after waking up, avoid food for at least one hour because we don't know that time your melatonin may, may be high, that can inhibit your insulin production. And then after your first bite, count your time to do eight hours, 10, nine, 10, or maximum 12 hours to eat. So that we call 10 hours TRE or 12 hours TRE. Most of our studies are 10 hours TRE. And then no food and no bright light two to three hours before going to bed. And uh, don't forget because light, daylight is the best antidepressant and it's plentiful, it's free. So step outside, have a brisk walk for 30, 30 minutes every day and that will be the best. So, so far, all these ongoing studies that are going on um, in our lab and in other labs in humans have shown that by doing this at least eight to 10 hours time just eating up to six months, these are the benefits one may see. And in future, we are hoping that there are now tens of thousands of people who have been sharing continuous data at least for 14 weeks for, with us, and these are the people all over the world, and hopefully we can test objectively whether by optimizing our circadian clock, we can prevent, reverse, and manage many of these chronic diseases. Thank you.